let's continue now as we get into our big stories for today. We're going to be discoursing solely on the SONA. Well, focusing on the SONA and matters related to it, like the e-levy, uh, which yesterday was passed. Or was it? We'll be hearing uh, from the different uh, people we've put together. Stalwarts Dr. Theo Champo will join us at a point. Uh, Franklin Kujo of Imani Africa. Dr. Joseph Obenguta, President, Kujopoku Energy Analyst. Um, uh, Dr. Kwame Asas, anti-political scientist. And Senor Hossi, uh, CEO Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors. All of them join us for this all-important conversation. And let me say good morning to all of you uh, who are here with us. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Kojopoku, can you hear me? Good morning to you. All right, so Kojopoku is trying to uh, get with us. Hi, I'm here. Good morning. How are you? I am very well, Kojo. How about you? I'm very well. I'm surviving. All right. You'll be going so. Uh, what what is what did you say? Yeah, the volume is very low. I don't know whether it's from my end or from your end. Is it is it better now? Can you hear me, Kojo? Is it better? The volume is low. Okay, so we'll work on the volume. Uh, stay with us, Kojo. We'll work on the volume. But I see Dr. Asasanti. I see uh, Dr. Joseph Obeng as well. Uh, Guta. President, Let, let's start on this note, even before we get into the sonar and matters arising. Uh, your quick reaction to the Black Stars qualifying for the World Cup in Qatar. Dr. Obing, uh, for you, I'll start with you in less than a minute. Yeah, uh, we, we thank God um, that they have qualified. Right. Um, they need to do even more um, so that we can showcase ourselves in the World Cup stage. It, it's a very good um, advert advertisement for a nation. So um, it's all good for us. Uh, Dr. Asasante? I'm happy, and I'm sure the nation is also happy. But there's more that we need to do. Now that we've qualified, we need to put our acts together because nobody gave us a dog chance to win this match. So we ourselves, we're not confident of our team. We need to put in the best and then get to Qatar and show the way. Uh, for you, Kojo, uh, I see, I, I hope uh, the sound is better now. Your quick reaction to the Black Stars qualifying for uh, Qatar 2022. Kojo Poku, can you hear me? Yes, the volume is much better now. Thank you. Great. So, so I'm saying your quick reaction to the Black Stars qualifying for the Mundial in Qatar. Well, um, we thank God. Um, we are going to be there. We are going to be uh, supporting the boys to make sure that they do well. For me, you know, every World Cup, every World Cup that we've gone to has come with its problems. Um, the concentration should be on the football. We should leave out the other item 13s that comes after every time we go to the World Cup. I'm hoping that we will put a lot more emphasis on training and good preparation for the boys. In, um, and GFA should really stop that thing where they, they now bring on unnecessary expenditures that now bring this whole thing into disarray. But it's a good ball. We, we didn't play as well that we thought we would have. It was okay. For the last 30 minutes of the match, the boys, I don't know whether they were defending or tired, but I hope, I mean, we can do better when we get to Qatar. All right. A uh, quick one from Dr. Theo Champon as well, right before we get into the nitty gritty. The Black Stars have qualified. How happy are you? What are you looking forward to? Uh, uh, good morning. It's a fantastic feeling. And I think it's great to see them uh, qualify. Um, we do have some months now to put the team um, in shape, so to do more uh, training. Um, but uh, the point also being that the boys who qualified, uh, we should try and get them to um, get to Qatar. I mean, there shouldn't be any attempt to go and bring in other people who necessarily didn't partake in the qualification. There shouldn't be any monkey they work by when they chop business um, uh, in, that, in that regard. But overall, fantastic, fantastic performance. All right. Let's get into the SONA, the State of the Nation Address. We thought it would have been delivered a long time ago. It's taken quite a while. It's been postponed twice, if 
memory serves. But better late than never to comply with Article 67 of the 1992 Constitution. Dr. Theo Champo, uh, I want your quick reaction to the, the measures as proposed by the finance minister to shore up our economy even before we get into what happened yesterday, the passage of the e-levy bill, and whether in fact uh, it has been passed is another story. But the economic reforms as proposed by Finance Minister Ken Oforiata, your quick take, even as we prepare for the Sona today. I, I think it's in the right ballpark. Um, there's a, the measures that have been um, introduced, and there are four or five uh, broad themes on them. There's the revenue side of the equation, there's the expenditure measures as well, and then there's also the uh, measures to deal with the CD depreciation, um, trying to pump in $2 billion into the, um, into the economy. But fundamentally, as you see, the finance minister in the statement recognizes that we are facing mm -hmm. um, economic difficulties, and he lists about five um, issues, rising fuel prices, rising cost of living, exchange rate depreciation, um, rising interest rates, and then also revenue mobilization challenges. Um, and in that regard, the measures that were announced attempt to deal with a, a number of these, uh, particularly on the expenditure side of the equation, where we've seen further announcement of cuts to uh, you know, expend, expenditures, including the ministers taking a 30% you know, pay cut for the, the rest of the year. And I, I think it's rightly in the in the in the right um, ballpark and it sends a good signal um, about what they intend to do to resuscitate or safeguard the economy when you look at the 15 peswa decrement when it comes to uh, prices at the pump when increments have been up to about five cds over a period of months does that suffice uh, the likes of guta and others have said you're killing I, our I, business, I, the importers and exporters. What what is your reaction to that? How is it? How do you feel I, that is I, going I to hurt the ordinary Ghanaian? The 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 fifteen p reduction actually is relatively negligible. I worked out the numbers. It works out to a two percent reduction of petrol prices at the pumps. So it doesn't really make much of a big uh, impact on consumers uh, at the pump. But the other fact also remains that. The government is facing revenue uh, mobilization issues and they need to raise some uh, revenues from somewhere. I had argued in the past that there are other tax elements on the price buildup of petrol that we could have uh, reduced. But overall, that 15p reduction is relatively negligible. It's just about 2% of the total price that you pay at the, at the pump. Would you expect that if prices stay the way they are, and uh, with some signs of positivity emanating from Ukraine and Russia after their meeting in Turkey, uh, would you propose that government do more, maybe on the tax buildup or otherwise, to reduce fuel prices even more? So it's not even just a question of the crude oil price on the international market. The two other things that we need to consider is also the exchange rate or the CD dollar um, uh, uh, um, uh, amount and we, that has had significant depreciation in the uh, past couple of weeks. So those two factors still all need to be at play in order for the government to be able to substantially reduce prices at the pump. So if the city stays stable and we do see oil prices going down as a result of, you know, the reduction of the tensions from Russia, Ukraine, and, and things like that, then all things being equal, you should expect some further reduction at the, at the pump. But at this stage, I don't think we're going to see uh, a much bigger reduction than we anticipate, just because the CD is still fairly not stable within the um, uh, Forex market. Hold for me, Doc, uh, Dr. Echampo. Let, let me come to... Um, uh, Dr. Asasante, Kwame Asasante, and, and thank you for your patience. Uh, I would like to find out from you uh, yesterday, and I'll, I'll start from the e-levy. You have followed the proceedings in the Supreme Court and the ruling that was uh, delivered, uh, you know, in, in respect of some of Parliament's standing orders. Now it has come to the fore because the minority caucus in Parliament walked out yesterday. And then the majority end went ahead to vote the, the, the key question, though, has to do with the numbers. 
whether there was a quarit, you know, number in there, the 138, because they did not have that. But the majority side uh, says the e-levy has been passed. If we are to go by the Supreme Court's ruling and what we know from the standing orders of Parliament, has the e-levy bill been passed from where you sit? Very difficult question because uh, yesterday uh, we're listening to uh, the goings on in Parliament and uh, there were this, uh, as we were, um, some aberration in the uh, processes because one would have thought that they would, you know, respect the rule and uh, kept it intact. But we saw a different thing. The good news is that the NDC want to test it in the court and see whether something will come out. Let's wait and see what comes out of the process and then we'll take it from there. But, but is it not clear? I mean, I, I felt that on the back of the Supreme Court's ruling, it would delineate some matters like we saw in the respect of the, uh, what constitutes a quorum, uh, whether the deputy speakers can vote and all of that. Uh, was it not clear enough? Sh should we still be doing this? I mean, it, it's pretty clear, isn't it? That's why I'm saying um, I was disappointed because, you know, the rules are clear and the Supreme Court ruling was extremely clear on these matters. So, so why is it that Parliament took the position that they did? So the best way are to also go to court and see whether uh, they can make amends and then we'll move forward from there. What would it mean if the Supreme Court directs that that was illegitimate what happened yesterday? It means they have to go back and all of that. What would, me what, what, what would it mean for governance generally, but for parliamentary business specifically? And I pose that question because people have spoken about being candid, doing the right thing, being honorable and all of that. Do you feel this is going to make uh, the, the engagement in parliament between the majority and the minority even worse. Already, the atmosphere in Parliament is polarized, um, partly due to the, the nature of Parliament we have here, and then um, events that follow, especially with the introduction of e levy bill, which uh, they did not consult. I'm talking about majority did not consult so much that it created all manner of what uh, problems for Parliament. If that is going to be the ruling of the Supreme Court, then I'm afraid we have no choice than to respect the ruling and build the institution as strong as possible to stand the test of time. Uh, democracy, if you want to strengthen its frontiers, you must adhere to the rules of the game. So I don't see why you be in a hurry or you want to bend the rules to suit a certain particular interest. You said a bad president and you worsen the political system. Is that what you feel happened yesterday? Why is the NDC trying to go to court? They were not satisfied with the process. And they thought that there were some aberrations that need to be corrected. So that is it. If it turns out that the Supreme Court says this was legitimate, so yes, the e-levy has indeed been passed, what would be your expectations? Mind you, some Ghanaians have said it's not about paying, it's about what we'll get from all of this. If uh, the Supreme Court's ruling uh, determines that, well, it's good to go. What would be your expectations as a citizen and reflecting what you've heard from ordinary Ghanaians? If that is going to be the position of the Supreme Court, then uh, one, government must sit and sit properly. Because, you see, I'm not an economist, but people with knowledge in this area have said that, yes, if you want to go on that tangent, the best thing should have been 0.5% in terms of the percentage of tax up to 1%. Once you move beyond that, then the, you are going to create difficulty in terms of what means of livelihood and how we survive it, right? That is obviously going to come. But government should not be oblivious of this because it had its own effect on how uh, people perceive the government and how they vote 2024. We put in government so that they would do the needful to make life better. So if a government policy trying to worsen our situation, we advise ourselves when we are going to vote. There is that uh, danger ahead, which they should do well to manage. Also, you realize that people were, you know, not happy about this e-levy, simply because they think that some of these resources are not put into good use. I believe that 
the government has learned a lot from uh, their activities when they were engaging people around the country and they pick some of this information. They have to sit down, make sure that the money that will be derived from these process will put to good use so that at the end of the day, transparency and accountability will be what? The real standard uh, that we use to measure the government. It is in the interest of the government to do that and then improve a lot of people. Uh, tied to this is what the issue of the economy. They need to set up and work the economy, uh, the economic mathematics very well because we are in difficult times. Let us remember that one of the factors that influence voter choices in this country is the issue of the economy. Irrespective of one's political tradition, party that you belong, everybody will want to have a booming economy so that they can also find a means of livelihood. This must occupy their attention and must work at it so that you will bring a sigh of real relief to the other man on the street. Otherwise, when we get to what elections, people are not going to spare the government. Two quick things, uh, but before I ask about what you're expecting ahead of today's SONA, what you want to hear as Mr. President speaks about the socioeconomic fabric of our country, I'd just like to find out very quickly, how do you feel about the minority uh, caucus walking out uh, in Parliament yesterday? It appears this is becoming a trend. How do you feel about the walkout? They say it was strategic, but what does this bode for us, politically speaking? I'm not worried when... Uh, a group in parliament stage a walkout is part of the parliamentary processes that you want to drum home some of your issues. But when it becomes one too many, then it calls for what reflection and then you take a different step. But for me, there's nothing wrong that if you are not satisfied with the process, you don't want to be part of it. Let us remember that these things remain the books and the standard of the test of time. So if you think a decision of government is not in line with your thoughts and your aspiration. You have every right to walk out and register your protest for people to know. Your expectations ahead of today's SONA. SONA Ebo, SONA Ebo, it's finally here. What are you hoping to hear from Mr. President? I want Mr. President to come out with something that touches on the economy. You and I know it is clear without doubt that we are in difficult times and the economy is facing a lot of challenges. We expect that uh, the, statement, the statement that the government will give will reflect how we improve the economy and then make life work much you know, easier for people to uh, go about their normal business. The issue of debt burden is um, becoming an albatross around our neck. We expect that government will also touch on that, work things so that we can reduce uh, this uh, debt bedding, which is uh, becoming a problem for us and crippling all the uh, businesses and whatnot. We also expect something to be said in the area of what fuel prices and how best they can address the issue. They need to go to the drawing board. Uh, there are a lot of suggestions that experts have said. It is better to pick some of these things and then work it in such a way that the ordinary man will also will not feel the pinch too much. Uh, having said that with regard to the economy, I want to zero in on politics, that we want to see that parliament as we move along will not be that antagonistic and they will all sit together to do parliamentary work. And this means that we must encourage consensus. Consensus is the magic word that they need to build parliament that will deliver the public good. And we expect that at the president will touch on that. The issue of accountability, transparency, it's something that is also on the hearts of many in this country, that we want to see how far government want to react to issue of accountability. There are a number of issues that people have demanded answers from government and they have not received reasonable answers. We believe that going forward, the president must do well to touch on these issues and give us hope that at the end of the day, we will believe the system that it will deliver what we want in the area of accountability and transparency. If you look at transparency international reports, all right, uh, issue of you know corruption, uh, they are still rating us in a certain light. But let us remember that the closer you are to zero, your country is more corrupt. So we should um, make sure that these things are tackled head on 
so that they don't affect the beauty of the governance system. It must occupy the attention of the president and we want to hear something positive in this regard. We want to also see more effort at strengthening the security system of this country to make sure that our security men who protect us also get protection. And also we help them to deliver uh, the service that is required of them. Uh, we have in recent time, sometimes flashy points and all that. Government must do well to come up with something that will arrest the situation and create uh, an atmosphere of peace. Already we have peace in this country, but we want to what, maintain and consolidate this so that we can run the government system uh, very well. Of course, issue of COVID, the, the president has touched on in recent time. Uh, so maybe something a little can be said about it and we move on. But we want to also have the president touch on issue of Ukraine and Russia because the, the goings on in the, that country, Ukraine, has uh, a lot of implications for West African country, African country, and for Amata Ghana. Right. And we should not be oblivious of this fact and do well to touch on and then prepare ourselves for difficult times around if uh, the, the situation don't get better. Uh, we hope and pray that the sooner will be the one that will change the fortunes of this country and bring hope to everybody in this country. Right. Uh, my last point is that uh, I want the president to touch on issue of coup and uh, that we are seeing in West Africa and the fact that we must do everything possible to you know, prevent it in this country. I, am, I belong to that school of thought who support democracy through and through. That if you have a difficulty with a political system called democracy, the best way is to use the democratic process to deal with, but not through any military adventurism that will not bring anything to us. I am hopeful that the president will look at all these things and throw it to us so that we can reflect and government can also work, do well to put them into practice so that at the end of the day, everybody will be fine in this country. We're grateful you've taken the time to join us and share your thoughts ahead of the SONA. Uh, Dr. Kwame Asasanti, and we wish you the best of the day. A political scientist, head of the Center for European Studies at the University of Ghana. Let me come now to uh, Dr. Please. Joseph Obing. And uh, I'll just ask uh, that you be patient with us, you bear with us. Dr. Theo Champong and uh, Mr. Kojo uh, Poku, just bear with us, you, you'll get your bite. Uh, Dr. Obing, now there are so many things to digest even before we get uh, into the sooner proper, but the land borders have been reopened and the e levy has been passed. When you look at our economy, what are your quick reactions to these two? How will the e-levy, for example, impact your membership? How will uh, you know, the reopening of the land borders impact your membership? Let's start from there. Uh, you, may, you may have to unmute, uh, Dr. Obain. Oh, sorry. Good. Am I on? Yes, I can yeah. hear you now. Th thank you so much. Um, I think we have to get it straight that the people who are paying taxes are just so few in this country mm. that we have potential taxpayers of about 13 million and that's less than 5 million of us are paying the taxes that is required in this nation. And that anything that ensures tax expansion, we are for it. Otherwise, most of um, the taxes that we are being paid actively revolves around just about 1.2 million people, which does not occur well for the nation. Uh, where we pay these taxes for the rest of us to depend on it. So anything that ensures tax uh, expansion, uh, we are for it. Otherwise, um, the, the trading community is always surcharged with these things, pay, um, uh, duties being increased with time and all that. So that's why um, the, the passage of the yield levy are comfortable. See, um, if you think about the e commerce, um, we rather put um, a pressure on government um, for e commerce to be taxed. And we are very happy that now uh, government have listened to our pleas because then. I, I, um, are, you saying, are you saying, Dr. Obeng, that you actually yeah. started? You, you, this idea was your brainchild that you put it to government that tax e-commerce. Is that what you say? You propose this to no, government? I, 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 you have to differentiate the um, e-levy from e-commerce. Right. The e-commerce 
is the business that is being done on the internet and all that. And we thought that is um, coming to urge us out, the traditional businesses. You know, we have the uh, fixed address and that the stores and all that. And so the task people can actually come on us and take this. But since the outbreak of the pandemic, you know that the new norm of trading is shifting towards the e-commerce. And so for us to be paying the taxes for the e-commerce people not paying means that there's disparity. And that's why um, uh, we, we put um, um, a pressure or a petition to government that they also are uh, uh, made to pay so that there's some parity in the trading that the traditional people will not be aired out. So anything that will ensure that we all pay our bit. But as to whether what we are um, 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 giving to us to pay is affordable, is what normally I've been saying, that taxes when they are affordable, the compliance level is high. So whatever we are doing, we also, we also have to uh, think about the rate or the levy, um, uh, the rate of the levy that we are made to pay. And then the, um, uh, we do not make it a monster out of a levy that will deter people from paying their bit. So um, um, that's why I, I, I wouldn't say anything bad against the G levy, and that. Um, so, it, so, it, so it, in, in, in other words, Doctor uh, Doctor Obey, you are in support of the E levy as it is, uh, pegged at one point five percent. Do you feel that is affordable, like you're saying, to the ordinary taxpayer? One point five percent. We have other countries in the sub region doing what? Zero point five percent, zero point two percent. In fact, in some countries, zero point two percent was proposed, and there was backlash. We are looking at 1.5%. From where you sit, is that affordable? Yeah. If you are uh, making, uh, you are bringing a tax, you have to make it so that the compliance level will be high. Okay, let's take, for instance, now you are charging 1.5. So if it is not affordable for the people, then they are going to the, uh, the device a new ways of um, dodging this tax. And that's what and may not even occur well um, for, for the system that have been, uh, that so many noise have been made around it. Because now you are giving people the option, though, um, after one million garnets, uh, uh, after one uh, 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 hundred Ghana cities, um, then you pay the tax. So when people break the lot into one million, one million transfers, it means that you are not um, uh, going to get the tax that you need. It means that people are dodging it. Because they have a way. If they are transferring 300 garnet cities, they can uh, uh, break bulk and they do it 100, 100. If it, even it is uh, each day, they do it, they will do it and then they will dodge it. But if the task is um, affordable and then um, um, negligible, people will pay without even. So, so the, question, the question, Dr. Obeying, uh, pointedly is is it affordable for you? Because, like I'm telling you, in other countries, right here in West Africa, it's been tried even at lower rates. People protested. Uh, transactions fell by about 50%. I mean, that could be our reality. Is it affordable for you from where you sit? Yeah, that aff affordable um, theory can be discussed. And you, you know that we have proposed well, uh, 0 0.5 before when the discussion started. So uh, affordable, uh, that's what I'm telling you. Affordable is very key um, for us, so for compliance and all that. So... Um, um, I, 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 the calculation that went in for them to insist on the 1.5 um, is, is better known to it. Maybe when we are arguing about the, uh, the implementation of the E levy, we should have concentrated on the, the rate of the levy and dwell on, on that. That would have even helped us more. Yeah. So um, uh, for a person to make everybody pay his bit for that so that um, um, the concentration will not be loaded on the importing community. We are always looking for um, tax expansion. And you have um, engaged me so many times where I've said that the tax net needs to be expanded. Even the, the, the road tax and the, the, the road uh, boot, the, the road tax that were eliminated, I was not even um, in favor of that. Because in any way, some drivers will also be captured into the net to pay these taxes. So anything at all, that will um, innovative way that will bring people into the tax net is welcomed for, for us. So that we do not load everything on imputation, the duties that we pay 
and the rest, yeah. My, my final bit to you, the economy is crucial to you and to your members. What are you hoping to hear from the president today as he delivers the State of the Nation address? What are you hoping to hear? What would be your suggestions uh, if you don't hear some things? So what, what are you looking forward to? Yeah, uh, before I go there, uh, with the e levy, I also wa uh, want um, to engage with the Ghana Revenue Authority now that it's, it, it is passed, so that we eliminate uh, any semblance of double taxation uh, for people who trade in this um, uh, Momo system and all that. So there too, we'll, we will uh, talk with the Ghana Revenue um, Authority to make sure that um, the, there's no issue of double taxation. Now for the um, general economy and then the SONA, as the president is going to talk, we know that most of the things have been already been discussed or uh, pronounced by the finance minister. The issues that uh, uh, goes with trading um, have been clearly explained to us in terms of tax expansion, um, the um, infusion or injection of two billion into the um, system. I think the uh, the president is going to reiterate on these issues, and we want um, government to um, 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 make a clear pronouncement that will uh, bring confidence into the system so that we can ensure stability into um, our local currency. In fact, that has been the bane of businesses. It is stripping us off. And so um, whatever will ensure um, um, confidence or bring confidence into the system for people who are trading in the currency to stop so that um, we can have um, stability in the currency, then it will help. That's why we, uh, we uh, was not in support of the Bank of Ghana when they revised the uh, the base rate based on the policy uh, rate. Inflationary, uh, yes, the, the policy rate um, uh, based on inflationary trends. What is the push factor for this inflation? The push factor is the instability or depreciation of the city. So what we will we, we have to um, focus and work on was yeah. um, to ensure the stability of the city so that by itself will um, suppress um, inflation. But uh, if you go and increase the base rate where we are already contending with high um, 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 uh, lending rates and all that, then you put an additional layer of burden on trading. And right. so that one, um, a, a government has to look at it. And then the sooner um, they, they reverse it, the better. And then right. we are talking about the, um, the, port, uh, the opening of the bodies. Um, and, 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 also, and very briefly, because of time, so that will have to be your final point. Yeah, uh, it's very important for us, and we are very happy about the opening because we have been complaining. Uh, because most of our um, members apply um, the, that route, that the cross-border trading activities, um, especially those of us who have a small capital, they trade in Togo, Nigeria, and all, all that. And so when even the borders were closed, they were going through unapproved routes at the uh, detriment of their own life and all that, because some of them's money were um, um, uh, robbed and all that. So having brought them into the mainstream um, to uh, do legitimate trading through the approved routes so that they will be well documented is very good for um, um, uh, those um, members. Right, yeah. right. Dr. Abing, thank you so much uh, for hanging out with us this morning and sharing your thoughts. Uh, when you, the Lord. president uh, does deliver the sooner, we'll come back to you later on to find out what you make of it. Uh, let me now move on to Kwejo Poku, energy analyst. Uh, Dr. Echampo, thank you for holding. You'll get your next bite soon. Uh, Mr. Kwejo Poku, uh, the e-levy has been passed, uh, so to speak. Of course, it's going to be taken up in uh, the apex court. But what is your take on... Uh, the rockers in Parliament yesterday on the back of the passage of the E-level uh, E-levy. What do you think is the way forward to have some sort of coherence or understanding or consensus in Parliament on the back of it? Right. Um, good morning and good morning to your viewers. Um, I would have thought that the roadshow that was done, the town hall meeting, was to try and get consensus and input from the citizenry. And uh, there will be some input of the, um, the town hall meetings into the new bill that was going to be laid. Um, I didn't know 
that uh, they were pushing ahead with the old bill that was already laid and going into second read. So if you look at it, you realize that not a lot has been input or no fresh um, suggestions or anything. The only thing that is different from what was laid in Parliament and amended is um, the 1.5 from 1.75 to 1.5 and insertion of some clauses to say that no third party would be brought on board to monitor um, or collect the e-levy except GRA. Now, for me, a bill like the e-levy should be consensual. It should have both parts of the floor because look, how many years down the line do we think that we are going to go before the minority also comes into power and probably now say that, look, we are going to campaign on the fact that when we come, we are going to abolish e-levy. We don't want a situation where something as crucial as revenue generation is going to be um, a do or don't matter at election. I have constantly said that I, Kujopoku, is against part of the e-levy. The e-levy bill, as proposed now, I have challenges with part of it. And I think that there should be more work done to make sure that everybody is comfortable with the bill so that we can all contribute towards it. You have the bill in each state, which was passed, where it double tax workers who have already paid their taxes and put their money on the electronic wallet to, to on the digital wallet to basically send it to people, friends and family or stuff like that. I have always said that there should be another technology or an IT architecture put in place to differentiate between merchants where you have to apply the VAT and NHIL and people who are just doing personal transactions. You cannot constantly be taxing people's savings, which in some cases you will be going into confiscation of um, savings. So it's unfortunate that um, it's been passed um, in a state that it's in. I think that we need a bill. Did, 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 did you just say, help. did you just say, Kojopoku, that it's unfortunate that it's been passed in the state in which it is? Yes, it's unfortunate it's been passed in the state because it's divisive. The state that it's in is divisive. I think that it should be passed in a state that both parties or both houses are happy with. Look, the opposition, the minority are opposed to part of it. I'm sure in the past three months, they have um, made some utterances of maybe 1% rate where they think that 1% rate, they would be happy to sit around the table um, there have been suggestions from some part of the minority on some part that they think that it double tax people who are sending money to friends and family. I, I also share that view. So, like, like I said, it's unfortunate that it's been passed in the state that it's in. Um, government needs the revenue. Let's not um, joke with that. Uh, we have all seen the state this economy is in. But the e-levy being passed at its state does not solve all our problems. If anything, is the beginning of most of our problems. Because now um, you have multi people who are going to stop using the service uh, because they don't think that they are prepared to pay 1.5% of that money they are sending. So your projections will not now pan out. Because your projections don't pan out, the e levy doesn't get to do what you claim is going to do. Then Ghanaians are going to look at you and say, Look, my brother, you said you're going to pass e levy and my road was going to be done. You're going to pass E-Levy, I'm going to be rich all of a sudden. You're going to pass E-Levy and all contractors will be paid, which we all know is not true. So we've had problems which have been going on for five years. We've not put plans in place to solve them. And all of a sudden, we have basically made it look like E-Levy is the, um, the magic one that solves all the problems. It's not. Uh, you, you just said that the passage of the E-Levy uh, into law, of course, uh, the president has to give us a cent to it before it becomes law, is going to be the start of our problems. How problematic do you feel this is going to be for the telcos, especially in other countries, other jurisdictions? We've seen how this has been forced down the throat of people, so to speak, and they have lost a lot of those, you know, transacting electronically by about 50% and more in some countries. And these are countries right here in Africa. How do you foresee, if it, if it is maintained in this current form, it could affect telcos? Well, I, I don't share no tears for telcos. I think that in Ghana, regulatory is very poor. 
Um, and that's one of the conversations that me and you can have on one of our morning sessions. I think our telecom system has deteriorated. The telcos have stopped being telcos and become bankers. They are all interested in collecting mobile money uh, commissions, but not concentrating upgrading the system that they are licensed to operate. So I don't share tears for telcos. I think that MP uh, NCA is doing a very bad job in monitoring and making sure that our standard of communication in this country is high. Um, today, we don't even know what data, how they charge per megabyte or how they charge the data. You, you don't even know how they charge your phone call. Okay, we don't know how much we pay per second. All these things, they are just ripping us off. And for me, I don't share no tears for telcos. What government needs to do is to invest in an IT infrastructure. Look, like the Guta president, the, the Guta gentleman said, we need to tax e-commerce. Now, if you need to tax e-commerce, it doesn't mean that you go and tax e-levy. Okay, e-commerce and e-levy e are two different things. There is a lot of transaction that goes on which government is not in the right position to tax because we don't have the technology to do that. We, we've heard about GRA trying to now make sure that Amazon and Google and all these people that people buy stuff or pay their fair share with holding tax and all that. How are you going to do that? You don't have uh, the slightest technology in that sense. Okay, so what I have proposed, and I keep saying it, and as usual, nobody listen, is for us to develop an interface. Look, all it takes, government officials like to travel. They should go to India. India has a simple solution called UPI, Universal Payment Interface. There's a, uh, an artificial intelligence platform that all platforms, all other platforms sit on. So your mobile, the, your mobile money, which is electronic wallet, will sit on that platform all your e-commerce, e-switch, all those things will sit on that platform. Now, that will help you determine whether um, somebody is making a transaction to a merchant, somebody is making a transaction to an individual user, somebody is making a transaction to a service provider. That platform will help you distinguish between these people who are making these different type of transactions. Then you'll be able to now tax them accordingly. You cannot just come up and say that you are going to tax service providers when you don't have the infrastructure to do that. You are going to rely on the telcos to tell you what is um, a service provider because his, his mobile money is registered as such. So for me, I think that government should invest in that infrastructure, then be able to differentiate between different users and tax accordingly. All right. Finally, in about a minute, maximum a minute and a half, your expectations ahead of today's SONA. Well, look, um, SONA, as the name sound, is state of the nation. Normally, when the president stands and speaks, um, he's always um, told us about achievements and things they've done. Whether it translates into a certain state in our country, he doesn't tell us that. Frankness and openness have always said that the president should have. The president believed that he was elected to fix the problems, not complain. But sometimes you should complain because if things that you are doing is not having the desired effect on Ghana, then you should tell us about it. What I expect from the president is to tell us if he is in touch with the people. We will know today. If the president come and tell us about roses and petals, rose petals and um, ice cream, then we know that he's not in touch with reality. So what we expect to hear from the president today is to hear from him if he really knows the state of the nation how people are going from day to day, how people are suffering, what he intends to do to address those suffering. That is the state of the nation. If he doesn't mention that and he goes and retreats some of the things he's done and the achievements and all those things, then that, that's not the state of the nation, unfortunately. Thank you so much, uh, Kojo Poku, for joining the conversation, and uh, we wish you the very best. Later, we shall reconnect after the state of the nation address. I have seen Senor Hossi, uh, in the background, uh, just to say a very good morning to you, Senor. Morning. All right, pleasure having you. Just hold for me. Let me wrap with Dr. Theo Echampo, uh, who is also uh, with us. Dr. Echampo, so you started talking about the economy. Let's broaden the conversation, talk about what you've seen on the back of exchange rates issues, on the back of fuel price hikes, on the back of the reforms that have been proposed. Uh, 30% of salaries of heads of SOEs going into a pool. We're not certain where exactly that will go. Uh, cuts when it comes to other people, uh, public uh, officers. I'm talking about the Council of State, among others. Uh, 15 peso reduction 
when it comes to uh, fuel prices and more. The policy rate being hiked up by 2.5 uh, percentage points, 250 uh, basis points. What is your quick take on that and what would be your expectation ahead of today's SONAF, purely from the economic standpoint? Um, so yeah, like, like I did indicate um, earlier, the point really is, and, and everybody alludes to this, that we are, we are in difficult times, uh, economic difficulties. Even the finance minister um, says that to be the case in the statement that he read last um, Thursday. Um, and in that regard, we're seeing this impact on multiple channels, on fuel price. We've seen inflation hitting almost 16 percent last month and probably may even go up much higher um, in the next month before uh, we start seeing some of the monetary policy interventions by the Bank of Ghana to hike up rates having a bit of an effect, you know, in trying to control um, inflation. We've seen the CD doing parogo on the on the forex market as well and then we've seen <laughs> the city doing what parogo <laughs> yes it's been dancing parogo on the forex market um and and then you know we've had revenue mobilization challenges uh, as as well um but to be fair what the government has attempted to do is try and address right some of the issues albeit in my view a little bit late um, in, in, at the end of the day, but still good um, in that sense. So, for example, some of the expenditure cuts that we have seen uh, being announced already in January of this year, the government said that they were going to reduce expenditure by 20 percent. And how they're going to do this is actually during, within the public financial management system, the allocations are made on a quarterly basis to the MDAs. So basically, they are capping the allocations to these MDAs uh, by or reducing it by 20% every quarter. And then in the new statement that was announced by the finance minister just last week, they are going to add an additional 10% cut in what they call um, discretionary uh, expenditure or spending. And then you've got other things like the 30% cut to salaries, reduction in fuel coupons, banning travels, all of that. The important thing to state here is that the cumulative effect of all of these cuts is still going to keep the deficit at 7.4% of GDP. So in the 2022 budget that was read last November, the government had a target of 7.4% uh, deficit by the end of the year. Then we saw the Russia-Ukraine crisis and things began to uh, take a bit of a feather hit. And so even with these new interventions on the expenditure side of the equation, it's still going to keep our deficit numbers at the same level as the, we had anticipated in the 2022 budget. What this tells you is that if these expenditure cuts hadn't been announced, then we would probably have been looking at a much, much bigger deficit, something probably in the region, in my estimation, of 9 to 10 percent by the end of this year, which then would not send a strong or a, a signal, a positive signal to the market. So what basically they're attempting to do is to rein in part of the expenditure. And then we also got bits of the um, revenue side of, of the equation. But the smaller interventions to do with the fuel prices, um, things like that. I have said that it's fairly negligible. It amounts to only 2% of the total price cut of uh, petrol or diesel at the, at the pump. So in that sense, it, it doesn't really do much uh, by way for, for citizens. So what I expect in the state of the nation really um, is the president will talk a bit about the overall economy and, and public finances and some of the interventions that they're making to address or to improve um, domestic confidence in the economy, but also investor confidence in the economy. I expect them to, uh, the president to talk about some of the recent moves and interventions by the Bank of Ghana, or the central bank to pump in two billion into the economy and whether that, that, that would help um, reduce some of the hemorrhaging that we're seeing 
uh, on the forex market with uh, with the city. But overall, I think the important point which uh, Kujo was making also is the fact that we need to move away a bit from this fixation with macroeconomic growth and macroeconomic numbers to actually connect them to what is happening at the micro level, right? And this is where in previous state of the nation addresses, I have found it a little bit difficult because we tend to be fixated on the big macro numbers without actually connecting them to how this is improving or showing at least the president um, giving us some metrics on how this is improving productivity at the grassroots and translating into uh, into into outcomes, you know, uh, as as well. But yeah, the, those those are really the, the core issues I would and um, expect the president to address. I don't expect any new policy announcements because uh, whatever interventions they're going to be making to safeguard the economy, I think has actually come out already from the finance minister's uh, press briefing of of last week. So the president would perhaps really reiterate. Right. Uh, a couple of these um, interventions. Okay, Champo, thank you so much uh, for making the time to join us. We'll, we'll confer with you again after uh, the soda. Dr. Theo Champo is no an problem. Thank you very much, and good morning to my good friend, Senior. Right, right. Uh, uh, thank you for good holding. Speak, yeah. Right, Senior. Uh, just hold for me. Let me acknowledge uh, that we have on the phone lines President of Imani Africa, Franklin Kujo. Uh, Mr. Kujo, a very good morning to you. I, I, I think I hear you speaking, but it's very faint. I can barely hear you. Okay, I'm actually trying to shout here. Um, good morning, how are you? <laughs> I am very well. I hope you are too. Certainly could be better, but we are grateful for life. We thank God. I'll be finding out shortly what exactly could be better. I know you'll be talking about the economy as well. Uh, but just bear with me, uh, ho hold briefly as I engage Senor uh, Jose, uh, who is CEO of the Chamber of bulk oil distributors. Uh, Senor, welcome aboard once more. Uh, let, let's talk about the rising cost of fuel and the 15 peso uh, reduction. I've heard some members of you know, the, the, the space you operate in say that they are expecting that up to about one city will be shaved off uh, the prices. Is, is that something you subscribe to, something you are leaning towards eventually? I think I granted you uh, your network, uh, an interview last week, and I indicated that there were efforts by government to try and uh, help BDCs access forward um, rates from the Bank of Ghana and through some other interventions that can help suppress uh, the price of petrol. And maybe cumulatively, we may be seeing an effect of between 50 and percent in the city. But it's just, again, strictly dependent on what those outcomes would be. Um, there's going to be an auction. Government has taken some steps today to try and uh, support the oil sector. And I'm very grateful to the Central Bank Government and the Minister of Energy for their interventions in this particular regard. Um, the outcome of the auctions would also influence or define the extent to which that reduction can be uh, realized. On the world market side, uh, the net effect of the prices have, have been almost zero. Prices have not materially. Um, reduced um, on an average basis for the previous window and uh, the window we find ourselves in today. So uh, we need to be a bit more flexible um, about that. Uh, let's see how the day ends and, and hopefully we should be able to find something a lot more concrete to discuss come tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening towards the 1st of uh, April. Right. Uh, we know that the Russo-Ukrainian crisis is still on, but th there have been some positive lights they've met. Uh, there have been meetings in Turkey, and it appears things might not be as bad moving forward as we expect. Uh, so, so looking at this turn of, of events and, and what you are talking about, how much more do you feel your chamber can do in terms of the rising cost of Fuel. What, what more do you think you can do uh, after today's SONA to ensure that some of these things you are talking about will actually see the light of day? Well, we've done a lot and uh, we continue to engage government to find ways to improve the situation and minimize the uh, uh, both government's fiscal and also uh, 
the consumers and actual prices at the same time. Um, we consistently advise, we run the policy analysis for government. And the BDC is to be, and yeah, relative margins have been more than half. Just so we all know, BDCs are not making money in these times. Everybody is trying to give up something to get all of us going. Uh, we live in this country, we are Ghanaians, and the success and the sustainability of our country will also define the sustainability of our own selves. Coming up with all the solutions to help government with the FX and all that, there are also solutions that are originated from us uh, as a chamber to help all of us get to solve the problem that um, is before us. Um, as new opportunities evolve, we will be leveraging that. And the bigger thing that we have to be thinking about is sustaining supply. You realize that in some of our West African countries, we are seeing shortages. Um, and uh, we definitely need to, uh, we really, we definitely need to uh, get uh, a supply situation under proper, proper control um, right here in Ghana. We've not seen shortages. So that's been what's been the primary focus of government. And also as an advisor to the minister, I would definitely be advising him that that should be the ultimate goal. And I'm happy to announce here that, I mean, steps have been taken led by um, Honorable Matthew uh, Oku Prempe, popularly known as uh, Napo, um, to, to address this situation. Yesterday, he met with all the business leaders of, the, of, of BDCs at the chamber, together with the NPA, for us to map up a strategy to ensure we do not face any kind of supply challenges or the shortages that we see around. And concrete steps are being taken to really address that. Come April 22nd, that's when the Russian ban import, the American ban of Russian imports will really be in full effect. So naturally, there would have been a risk, a, a heightened risk coming. But Honorable Mati Oku Pempe, together with the Chamber and the NP, have taken steps um, that are, are designed to, to avert any, any, any such crisis. So we will continue working to make sure the state of the nation on the petroleum side is sound and, and, and stable. One of the things I'm hoping to hear from the president today, really, is a proper conversation about the extent of political polarization in our country. We are worried as business people. We are worried as, uh, as citizens. The adversarial politics is, is, uh, is somewhat getting out of hand. The lack of consensus building and cooperation and the depolarization, not just at the echelon of politics, but even at the grassroots of politics, is more frightening than ever before. And I want to see the president take steps to reconcile this nation, to get this nation to cooperate and coordinate more towards a common goal for our mutual development. Uh, that, that must mean, very briefly, that must mean you feel there's too much polarization, right? It's excessive and it's threatening. And I think that we should quickly take steps to address that. And to be good to have the president in his tone and his speak leading that charge, okay. calling for unity, calling for cooperation. Right. And um, I, I hope to hear that from the president today. Senor, thank you so much for joining the conversation, uh, like I've done Pleasure with the others. Man. Hopefully we'll interact again after the sooner and you can share your thoughts. Have a good day. That is Senor Jose, uh, CEO Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors. Let me quickly bring in Imani Africa's president, Franklin Kujo. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kujo for patiently waiting. Let's start from the, the angle of the e-levy. Yesterday it was passed, or was it? Mm. The court will determine. Uh, but, but what is your take on the e-levy? Yes, I know some of the things you've said in the past, but with what happened yesterday in Parliament, what do you think this is going to bring as far as the e-levy is concerned and as far as consensus building in our legislative house is also concerned? Well, thank you very much. I was hoping that the of uh, I mean, a passage or otherwise would have had the uh, people in a room. Uh, unfortunately, it looks as if they were they were ambushed, as they say, and then uh, unfortunately, the turnout was that the majority side passed it. Um, this goes to increase or if you like uh, make it more difficult to have political conversations about just anything that matters in this country. So the e-levy situation, uh, I'm afraid, rather excessive. It already tends political relations that we have in the country. And you do not want to see that, really, in a country that already 
people are uh, everybody is complaining about the hardship in the economy. The last you want, or the last of the things you want is to have this hydra-headed problem of having political actors not talking or speaking to each other on very important economic matters like the like it, like the left. So I was quite disappointed at what happened yesterday. Uh, and I'm thinking that beyond the adversarial approach of going to court and counter court uh, actions, um, the president may have to call for a truce. And I think calling for a truce also means that there must be some renegotiation about the rate of the e I right. still hold the view. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm listening. I still hold the view that um, it, it a tax, the e is a tax that indeed uh, sounds and looks democratic, uh, but the timing of it and the rate, and again, uh, must be looked at in order to ensure that uh, the already bed in Ghanaian is not, is not further exposed. So that's my view on the e -Levy. That's okay, so, so that, very quickly, uh, before you give us your expectations uh, ahead of today's SONA, uh, you say you were disappointed and the e-levy, uh, the rate. Some have spoken about how affordable it could be. What would be affordable? What do you think would be affordable for the ordinary Ghanaian? Not 1.5%? Well, I mean, beyond the questions about affordability, it's also about the, the nature of the tax. I mean, I think that it, has, it should have been progressive, given what had happened in other countries when uh, it has been introduced as well. You know, right. uh, even for as low as 0.5%, Mm -hmm. I think in, was it Uganda? Uganda was 1%, brought to 0.5%. There was still a lot of, uh, there was still a lot of turmoil. Uh, even in Ivory Coast, I'm sure you know that the rate wasn't as high as that of Ghana. Um, there was some challenge. So I thought that progressively, it should be between 0.75%, at least a max of 0.57% as a start. Then you take and see if really it is going to be something that people would accept. But don't forget, there's, we had a similar scenario with the communication service tax. Right. When it was hiked to about 9%, um, there was a dip in the total revenues that were collected. But when it was reduced again to, I think, 6%, we saw some incremental uh, changes in terms of the, turn, uh, the turnover. So I definitely wanted a rate that was lower than 1%. Right. Uh, you, you, your final thoughts then, expectations in just about a minute, a minute and a half. What are you looking forward to, to hearing from the president as, as he delivers the SONA today? Well, I think a lot has been said by your other co uh, panel that, panelists as well. And I think for me, at this juncture, what stands out are two things. I mean, the economy, what is being done about the economy, as well as the political polarization senior referred to right now. On the economy as a whole, we were expecting to see some deeper cuts in terms of the flagship project. We didn't hear that with the finance minister. I do not want to believe that the president would uh, would announce further measures that to the extent that he is going to probably insist on ensuring fiscal prudence and his administration. Um, that would be welcome if we hear it again and we hear it better. Um, I'm not sure he's going to make any new announcements beyond what the finance minister did. I, I, um, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, I'm sorry, but you're saying you're, you don't think... I'm not sure he's going to announce any expenditure rationalization as in reviews again or deeper cuts beyond what the finance minister did. Okay. Uh, uh, if there's anything at all, he's going to insist that he's going to be prudent, his government is going to be prudent fiscally. Um, I would have wished that he did, uh, there were the cuts were much deeper, uh, but I'm not sure we're going to hear anything like that. And I think the other big ticket issue would be the polarization. There's just too much tension in the country. Mm. And if you add that to the already tense, already uh, difficult economic situation, it, it, it doesn't look good at all. And he's, uh, he's the only person who can help diffuse the tension. Right. Mr. Kujo, I know how busy your mornings are. Thank you so much that you made the time all the same to interact with us. We're grateful. A pleasure. All right. Thank you uh, very much.